Okay, hey, welcome to today's garden class. So we're talking gardening for newcomers. This is not just for newcomers, you just want to up your game. Just remember what are the frost names with the zones, kind of technical side of things. I'm not going to go so deep on the plants. We'll touch on the bro briefly. I've got other classes that go deeper into how to do vegetables, how to do herbs, how to do fruit trees. This one's more, when do you start? What are the seasons? A lot of Californians here, a lot of folks from uh, the deserts, Phoenix, Tucson. Everything you all knew about gardening, you just have to erase, reboot, start over. Because it does not apply up here. Just four, definitely four seasons. We saw this last week, though. We live up in the mountains, it's great. And then we're buried in a foot and a half of snow. But we're still trying to bury, get, get a bury here. So that's pretty common. So my name is Ken. I'm the owner of the garden center. So how does Ken Lane come to own Waters Garden Center? Well, Harold Waters started the garden center 62 years ago this year. So and he had four very attractive daughters. <laughs> and I took a fancy of the youngest, prettiest daughter. So Lisa Waters, I married 30 six years ago. <laughs> and so we came in and, and uh, so with the second generation of my, my daughter, Mackenzie Lane. She is taking over since the third generation. So this next over for another 20 years. So very much family oriented, very much small town. We put, put on a bigger uh, show than we really are. This is where friends and neighbors, we're the people you'll see at the grocery store, the, at church, kids playing soccer, out in the community. So it's just us. So we have been guarding here for a lot of decades. And I want to share some of those things with you today. A couple things we've got. I want to share zones and the sun. This elevation is, will change for you, especially Midwest folks. The seasons, what are they? There's more than four. Frost states, we've got to get that out of the way. It's short and sweet. There's only two of them. When you start, when you end. Water, water, water. Number one question we have anywhere is how do I water? Got to cover it. Food, got to cover it. Fruit and veggies. We're starting the fruit and veggies season. Um, we got to get cactus out of the way. You can't grow them up here. You're not in Phoenix. Saguaros don't grow up here. We'll cover it. We'll touch on something new. There's a few, but yuccas and agaves, we'll touch on that. And then what do you need to be doing right now? I mean, we are at the start of the season. There's some things you have to get done. So we'll cover all that in about 45 minutes. We'll have a lot of Q&A. This is kind of a big class. We'll probably, I'll leave a big block at the end just for Q&A, just so we can cover those things. Okay? Sound good? It will start now. I've got four handouts for you. One, guarding for newcomers. If you're a note taker and I missed a note, you just go go back. You'll have the note. You'll have the entire reference in your inbox this afternoon. Okay. How to fertilize? It'll get technical. There's four times to fertilize. You'll miss one of them. I'm going to give you the handout. Here's when you do it. Here's what you do it with. It'll be a game changer. How to water. So I've got four of those for you. If you want that, shoot your email on here and I will personally sit down on my computer this afternoon and go, here is a, here they are for you, okay? If you're part of our gardening club already, but if you don't, you should be. Um, it's not going to all like 10,500 garden clubs. It's only going to you all, okay? Just to you. I don't want to plug up everyone's email. So if you want those, and some of you, um, if you could take a moment, uh, some of your handwriting is terrible. <laughs> terrible. I'm appalled. Please take a moment because I am personally going to take this thing out. I'm trying to interpret. Is that a B or a six? What is that? What are they trying to say? So I'll try to send it. Just take a moment to a little bit more care. Just kind of pass it that way. Just make sure everyone gets it. So it looks like I, if we run out, I think only if we run out of pages, turn it over and run to the backside. Okay, let's talk about. Zones and the sun. So on the end of block, on the back side of plant tags, on all of our plant tags, we put the zone for you. We are a zone seven, okay, seven. We need plants to go down to five, 10 degrees before they die. That's a cold hardiness zone. It's a national thing. Uh, and you'll have a copy, you'll have a, a map of the zones. You can grow plants that are zone seven, Six, five, three, two, one. So that and lower, you're good to go. So lilacs, famous here for our lilacs, or for Cynthia. They'll start blooming here shortly. Famous. 
Those are zone four plants. They go down to minus 20 degrees. We'll never see that, but they can grow. They can take, they go, they, they grow in the Midwest. They can go that low, but they also grow up here. What you want to stay away from to watch for are the desert plants. Because we have such a strong Phoenix influence, and the box stores just say, Should send 50 of those to all my stores, you're going to find in the warehouse plants that shouldn't be sold up here. Check the zone. He says, Zone seven, you're probably okay. Well, first of all, don't ever buy a plant that's been in a warehouse for three weeks. It's not going to transition outside. It will not end well for you. You want outdoor plants going for outdoor spaces for outdoor. Because our sun is so intense, this elevation, this is different. This is going to be a channel for you Midwest folks. You used to go, oh, my geranium to grow right outdoors in California. Oh, Japanese maples grow right outdoors. The tag says it grows right outdoors but not when you're mild in the air. It will grow, but it will be the ugliest plant you've ever seen because the, the, the maple will get burned leaves, it'll struggle. Those tend to do better in more of a shaded or a protected area in full sun. So Southern California, full sun, they are glorious at sea level. You're no longer at sea level. The apple, and there's no, uh, there's not as much humidity and we're higher elevation. That tends to play with some things, your geraniums. I find geraniums grow full, to, full outdoors. In the Midwest, that's where they grow them. Mine bloom longer, better, stronger, and they're a little bit of protection. The east side, west side, of that midday sun, they bloom nonstop. So put them right up there in full sun. So you'll play with some of that going, huh, this isn't like, you're not in Kansas anymore, Jodo. <laughs> it's changed. And so you'll struggle with some of that. That's that's okay, that's no burden, that's how we learn. My goal is to get you out of some of those real blunders. Stay away from zone 9, 10, 11, 12. Those plants, your zone 7. So it's a Prescott Valley. You all think you're so special. I just love you guys. You're the same as the rest of us. Zone 7. You're all zone 7. Paulman, you're zone 7, if not zone 6, because that cold air spills down on top of you from Ash Fork. And kind of, you get the extremes, the hottest of the hot, the coldest of the cold you'll see what we call microclimates. It really comes down more than zones. It comes down to north, south, east, west. So I've got a north facing house. I'm overlooking the Dells. It's beautiful up near the Crystal Lakes area. It is a beautiful, it's a view. But man, there's still a foot and a half of snow in the backyard. The front yard where the sun hits, the west side, south side, it's all melted or just about all melted. That north side, whoo, you folks up the elevation, so Groom Creek, uh, Highland Pines, these ridge lines, you got the vistas, you got the views, but the snow tends to you're just above that, that snow line where it hits you a little bit heavier. So it's gonna come down to I find my best gardens. I'm just kidding. We're just friends, we're gardeners to talk, talking over the back fence. These are my gardens where I find they work the best. My east side gardens, magic. Everything grows. Because it warms up in this in the winter even it's the first thing to warm up keeps the frost off and so that's where i tend to put my herbs my veggies a lot of my more sensitive stuff now i'm a true gardener i learned years and years ago don't ever tell a gardener what you can or cannot do they'll prove you wrong okay so i like to grow some i flirt pretty strongly with some zone eight stuff these are plants that can go down about 15 degrees before they Die. We've seen 15 last week in many parts of the area, so we're that's really borderline. So I'm growing things like I've got a magnificent fish, fish hook feral cactus. This is a strong zone eight plant. So what I do is I grow a pot, big, beautiful bowl, just like you see in the front of Fine Garden Magazine. I've got that, but this thing is about this big around. This is magnificent. What I do is I change its microclimate throughout the year. So when, during the season, I throw it out there in the patio where it's hot, just roast, just beautiful. Everyone comments on it. But in the winter right now, I've got it underneath the overhang at the front door. This is not coming indoors with me. This, this screams bite my ankle. It's not coming indoors. Okay, it's gonna grab your pajamas and like tear them to shreds. Not gonna, this is gonna be for outdoors. So, but I do bring it underneath the overhang so I don't get all that frost snow on it. And then I let it, I let the container touch the house. 
because your house throws off an amazing amount of heat. And that, I have kept it alive for years just for that little trick. So you can do little things like that. Now, some of your neighbors, you'll see, they're, they're not crazy. They're just gardeners, okay? Instead of medication, they garden. So they're out there, and you'll see little tents and burlap and things in the little bubbles of warts of burlap covering plants out in the yard. They're protecting zone eight stuff. They're just trying to see if they can get it to go. It's one of those things, don't tell me what I can grow. I'll prove you wrong. That's a gardener. And so there's ways to do that, but that's zone eight. Now, if you're on the other side of the hill, Camp Verde, Jerome, Cottonwood, Sedona, those, that is a zone eight. They got a lot of snow. Black ice was everywhere last week on that side of the hill. There's still a high elevation, but that sun just hits it just, just enough where it changes the zone, just, just one extra zone. So if you're up in uh, um, Broom Creek, you're probably in zone six. It is colder at 6,500 feet than it is at 5,500 feet. And so you'll, you'll play with that some. But you'll find your east side kind of easier to grow in. West side, the one thing we need to watch is uh, the, the uh, south was just exposed. It's, it's June is your hardest month to grow things, June, not January. It's June. The reason being, it's 90 degrees out. It's 10% humidity. If the humidity gauge even registers humidity, it's really dry. There's a prevailing southwest wind that just blows. It's nonstop. Stay in night all the time. And the plants have these brand new leaves out. It's dry breeze, not wind, it's a breeze, and it can, it can dry plants out. If you hit that midday, you know, 10 to 2, middle of the day with, with 90, no, no humidity, and brand new foliage, you need to be spot on with your watering. It's got to be accurate. And so your irrigation, you might play with your irrigation a little more here than you do other places because drip system is basically ICU for plants. You're on an IV drip. They're just trying to keep it alive. That's all it's doing. It's barely keeping the plants alive until we get a rain event. And usually the, the, the rain cycles here, there's a definite, it starts, we say around July 4th, there's the monsoons. You'll hear the monsoons happen. Really, it's August and September are, are really wet cycles. And then March, there's another definite spike in moisture content. And so those are the times when you'll tend to kill plants because we're getting a, an afternoon rain probably two or three times a week. Plus, you're still watering every day, maybe too much. And all of a sudden, we get overwatering the plants. And the plants will start to turn yellow. I start to get weepy. My tomatoes stop producing fruit. There's indication that something's going on. You're going, I'm killing my plant with love. Some of you, your, your hobby's not gardening. <laughs> Some of you, you love your coffee in the morning. You love watering. That's, that's your, that your hobby is watering. You'll, you'll be prone to overwater, especially out in the valley areas. They got that heavy clay soil. And with caliche layers, you've never heard the word caliche until you moved here. It's a, it's a white kind of gray band of soil, not soil, of concrete <laughs> that runs through the soil and, and water doesn't penetrate it. It doesn't go through it. And so if we run into that, you're planting, let's see, just put this guy away. It bit me anyway, doggone it. Okay. True native. Perhaps this is silverberry. Silverberry. Or Ellie Agnes is the flat name. Ellie and then Agnes put them together. That's this plant. You will see this growing wild out towards Skull Valley, Dewey Mayor, that area. It's, it's truly it's a shrub about this big, nice evergreen, fragrant flower. I mean, just you will smell this in the spring. It's wonderful. Uh, get it up to size, and then never water it again. It's that kind of care. Animals don't eat it. Avalana, deer, it, it mocks antelope. It's just it's fine. Okay, so it's not animals aren't going to eat truly native. The reason it's so hardy, you're seeing a lot of. Look at that, I am bleeding. <laughs> Ouch. Okay, so this is pretty common for, for drought efficient plants. You'll see the, the, the front side. You go, you book, we know you're there. We know you You better have your pants on. Don't, don't just show me this part of it. So, you know, you assume it's all about. So you'll see uh, um, photosynthesis from this side. The back side is often white. 
This is an efficiency thing. It's protecting itself. It's actually a coating, so it doesn't perspire. So it's only losing moisture out of half of its foliage. So it's this is the side that does all the sun photosynthesis. And it's very super efficient. And you'll notice it's kind of waxy. So it makes it super efficient on its watering needs. So if you're going to kill this plant, it will be over water. Heavy clay soil. And so let's just cover that real quick. I was going to go how to plant later, but let's just while we're on it. Just see, and here's the problem we have with Phoenix. So down there, they say plant everything in a divot. You want a rain harvest? Make sure it's easier to water your plants. For the love of gardening, don't do that here. You want your root ball. Here's the soil. Phoenix says plant in the holes. It's subterranean. So if you do that here, September, August, or November. Will tend to get too much water in there and can't breathe any drains. So we want to be at soil level, or even for you folks in the valley, since our half the group is from the valley areas, actually over between Chino, Chino, Palo Alto, Presque Valley, Dewey, we all are all the same, same soil. It's, it's terrible, terrible soil. You want to be even slightly above soil level. Put your plant above there. Here's your give up. I'm really good at dictionary. I'm not very good at uh, drawing, but here's your plant. So now you put your water basin out here, or you put your dripping mitter up on top of this, just slightly feather the soil down so the plant's just slightly above soil level. It would be a game changer, especially if you're doing natives, conifers, uh, uh, spruce, pine, fir, cedar, cypress, junipers, all these evergreen kind of things. They're, they do not like to be too wet. They would rather be drier than wetter. This ensures the root, at least this much of the root can breathe in the wettest of, of, of rain cycles. It'll be a real game changer. Um, so an example would be when I'm planting this, I would leave this much of the root out of the ground and I would slightly, I, I wouldn't leave it exposed and just raise it above the surrounding soil about that much and then feather the soil down. So you'll be the only one that can really tell it's just above grade, but it, it totally changed. My first house was in Prescott Valley. Very familiar with that soil out there. I killed so many evergreens mainly. And uh, if I did this little technique, everyone would live just like that. Because it's like being in a pool. If we submerge you under underwater for more than three minutes, what's going to happen? It's not going to be good. Well, this allows the nose just to, just to be above, so to keep breathing until it dries out again. That and your soil is terrible, and there's not one living thing in your soil. There's not one worm. There's no mycorrhizal colonies. There's no organics. Whatever good thing there was there, your contractor took it, scraped it, moved it up to the side, threw it over there, so you put your footers, driveways in. Many of you are, are literally dealing with dead soil. Look at this. You'll plant something. And it just won't grow. It's, it's almost like it's mocking you. I'm, I'm, I refuse to grow here. I will not grow in this spot. And three years later, it's the same size. Does it die? Does it grow? Just, that's a that's a that's a soil issue. So we encourage you to add a bag when you're planting. Just while we're on planting, you're going to need three things whenever you plant. Yeah, but what about peonies, Ken? You'll need these three things. What about a pine tree, a fruit tree? You'll need these three things. What about a vine? Honeysuckles, trumpet vines. You'll need these three things. Whatever you plant. Yeah, but I'm in Dewey. You need these three things. <laughs> Prescott Valley. You need these three things. It's what this is the game changer. Uh, you folks out towards uh, 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 Granite Mountain, you've got very sandy soil. And all the water just goes whoosh right through it. So you need mulch to hold the moisture up around the root ball to keep it drying out too fast. You folks out in the valley area with that real heavy, thick soil. It keeps the soil from compacting right back down so the roots can, can still get through the soil. So either way, no matter what kind of soil, you, you can do this, okay? So when you dig your hole, it's going to be the same depth as the bucket. Get this back. Same depth. It's hard for you contractors. Some of you guys have backhoes still. Come on. You've been retired now. Give that thing up. You don't need a hole down. You don't need, if you've got if your chest high in the hole, you, you open it. You've got OCD. You've got issues. More than just garden. You're going to need some help. Just go the same depth. Okay?
because the roots do not go down here. It's, it's a total depth. There is no tap root. Roots go down about this deep and they go sideways. They're running sideways because that's where the water, the moisture is. That's where the nutrients are. Plants are pretty smart. So even big trees, the roots go sideways. You know, a big cottonwood, the roots go like 100 feet sideways. They're massive. They're all over the place. They're going sideways. If you know that's how they're going to they the program to grow, just encourage it. So we're going to take a bucket, a hole, three times the width, same depth, round it, kind of saucer shaped. It is so much easier to dig a, a, a wide, shallow hole than a deep, narrow hole. That's just, that's killer down there. So if you happen to run into two things, rocks and boulders, and some of you up in that timber ridge area, but you've got boulders, means you'll get done digging the hole and you just have a big old rock sitting there. <laughs> there you're gonna have to maybe supplement some topsoil or something, kind of backfill into that. Uh, some of you on Fresco Valley you get these potatoes or something, they just rise up out of the ground every two, three moisture minute. They just, I don't know where they come from. They just emerge. Anything bigger than a golf ball, get rid of that. And it's not your friend in the hole. So it heats up in summer. They're too big of particles to hold water molecules. They just, they bake the roots. So anything bigger than a golf ball, screen it out, screen it, get rid of it, okay? Roots. Some of you, like I dug out, I planted one of these in my front yard, and I ran into the contractor buried brick in the front yard. Just saving a, just saving a run, took it up, saving 10 bucks, but he buried it right there. I'm like, that's not good for my plan to dig up all these bricks. Out of, so screen that stuff out. The soil that's left, you're going to add, about 25% mulch to your native soil. All we're trying to do is add some richness, add some organics, add some, it's gonna, this is what's gonna feed, this is what's gonna attract the worms, the mycorrhizal colonies, all the good stuff that makes the soil alive. That's what's gonna make this go. Plus, it's gonna keep the soil from compact, we're changing the structure of the soil so it can't compact back down. Or if you got real sandy soil, it's gonna hold moisture around the roots so it doesn't dry out so fast. It's, it's a game changer. That, kind of an insider tip, all of our plants have mycorrhizals added to them. These are beneficial bacteria that attach themselves to the roots and extend the roots out so they become hardier. So we're noted as a place where our plants live. That's the reason. It's one of several reasons. Well, those mycorrhizals, they feed off of organic matter. So if you've got if you plant one of our plants, a little bit of this, it's going to live. Okay. So about 25%, uh, if I hit a if I hit a big rock or something, I've cheated that up to about 50-50. Over that, it just stays too wet. You almost need to get some topsoil or something. If you hit a big rock or something, you need to fill in. There, I just get another bag of, of, of topsoil to help. Okay? So about one shovel mulch to three shovels soil. Okay? I said three things. That's number one. Number two, stay there. Your crown. Actually, gardeners, we don't use the word dirt, do we? we? Use the word soil. Your soil has not one bit of food in it. There is no topsoil. You're not from Wisconsin with eight foot topsoils. You know, Iowa, oh my gosh, I don't, you throw the hat out there on the ground and start to grow. We're not that. It's gonna, you're gonna have to nurture it, nurse it a little bit. So you'll find you fertilize more often here than you do other places because there's no naturally occurring fact. We super sterilize the soil so not even weeds will grow. We scraped it, we put fabric on it, and then we buried it with uh, you know three inches of mocha colored rock. So you're gonna need to fertilize more often than other parts of the country. So with that being said, you know that a new plant's gonna need some food. Take a handful of the food, sprinkle it around. It's organic food we put together. We're here. It's made to work with our water and our soil. It's all organic, so it's safer than the synthetic stuff from the box stores. And it, the beauty with organics, it releases over a much longer period of time. So every time water hits it, it releases a little food over the next three months. Perfect for new plants. When you get all done, the plant is absolutely going to freak out. Okay, it is gonna go, we call it transplant shock, but really it's, you've just, you've just surgically had brain and heart surgery all at once on this plant. It doesn't even know what it's doing. Put it into your soil, which is terrible. It's going to freak out. So you want to stabilize it with root and grow. It's just, this is for transplant shop. Okay. So it's basically 
It's a compost tea we make. So it looks like molasses. It actually looks like fish emulsion with all, all the stink. You know that. So fish emulsion just stinks to high heaven. That's offensive. I don't like stinky things. Even our even our, our manure is deodorized. It just not, I'm not going to put that into your Lexus. It's, I'm not going to do that to your car. So this is kind of a deodorized organic. It's concentrated, so it turns the, the water kind of brown. And you water it in, the plant just goes, oh, it's got to be okay. It just kind of activates everything. Uh, I'd say use this every couple of weeks, at least twice, um, until you see the plant stabilized. Eventually, you'll be going, get a few yellow leaves, kind of we weepy a little bit. All of a sudden, it gets perky and goes, oh, I guess it's okay. Starts to put on a few leaves or another flower, takes off. Okay, so that's how you plant. Mulch, food, root to grow, same depth, twice the width. Got it? Yeah. Good. It's too easy. We'll go with that more in just a second. You should. That will be a game changer for that. That one lesson right there is worth the class. But remember, it's just a free class. So <laughs> fail, it's not my fault. I'm trying to help you. The seasons. We have six seasons. One, spring. Actually, right now we are in early spring. So you're going to see, as soon as this, this ground thaws, the daffodils will elongate, or Cynthia's will take off, the winter blooming jasmine, everything's going to take just all at once. So by March 1, it is full on, not full on, it's leading edge spring, early spring. Early spring is defined by very warm days, 62 today, freezing tonight. That's early spring. That will happen through April. So now through April is kind of early spring. Traditional spring is after the frost dates. It's May, first part of June. It's really spring because our frost dates are Mother's Day is what locals use as the demarcation line. It's actually May 8 is the average last frost of the year. Averages are funny. It's 100 years of data. May 8. You know, 50 of those years, it was end of April. The other 50 was middle of May. But the average is May 8th. So locals use the holiday, Mother's Day, just as a way to remember. Okay? So you can get frost. So you will be totally tempted to plant tomatoes in March. Totally tempted. Because it is so nice. And we've had, it, we've had two weeks of really nice weather. But there will be frost again. It will happen. And tomatoes are one of those zone 9, 10 plants. If you look at it cold, it does. <laughs> Basil. I mean, if you if it gets below 50 degrees, it needs a parka. I mean, it needs to be protected. They want to die in the cold. So you're better off waiting until after frost dates, until the first part of May. In the April, I'll kind of cheat a little bit. There's some ways to, we have a vegetable class coming up that will teach you how to cheat it and kind of, you don't have a greenhouse, here's how you do it. Get a, an extra three weeks growth on, on your plants. But for just regular folks, remember Mother's Day. The first frost in the season is Halloween. It's actually October 29, but locals use Halloween. Now it's going to be, and you know, it's so nice, September, first part of October. Now it's going to be late this year. No, the first part, the end of, end of October, first part of November, it's going to be chilly, and that's when you need to really watch, protect those that last crop of cucumbers, last few geraniums, last few. You can cover things and keep it going, really, through November if you can protect things. So now you folks, do we have anyone that have greenhouses in here? Cheating, total cheaters, total cheaters. That's just cheating. That's awesome. I'm so envious. I don't have one of those. But that's, the rules are off. You kind of control your environment. Great. Okay, frost and season. So early spring, spring, summer. Summer is going to be great myrtles. It's going to be uh, rose of Sharon's hibiscus. Uh, it's going to be uh, smoke trees. There's all this series of very of heat lovers. They love the summer heat. So uh, a little insider tip with those: like desert willow. That's a summer. I call that a summer plant. Blooms in the summer. Hummingbirds love it. I will start getting phone calls, usually middle to late April. It's like every hour. I think I killed my plant. I think it's not going to live. I think it's going to be summer plants have no interest in spring. They are waiting till it's warm. It's all about ground soil temperature. So your grapes, they don't like spring. 
They're waiting till it's warm enough to start to grow. So you'll swear they're dead. But they are just waiting. Great myrtles. They're the last thing to leaf out in spring. I mean, it's May before they even consider leafing out. But then summer through through autumn. Nothing is prettier than a, than a great myrtle. Well, I think it has a bright flower. It's spectacular. Okay, so that's early spring, spring, summer. In between spring and summer, I have a separate season I kind of threw in there. I call it perennial. So June is when we are famous for our, our, our perennials. So peonies, gallardias, coreopsis, all those things, that, that Midwestern like wildflower thing, we grow them even better than they do because we have great sun. And we don't get all the disease things that a humid climate gets. We don't get, we, we don't get black spot. We don't get all these leafy disease things. Um, animals might eat some of them, but they don't really like perennials that much. And so June is when you'll find the garden center. We've got all the perennials, and they're all in bloom. They're finally old enough. And so I've got a few perennials right now. So I've got this one. This is Hookara. Or coral bells is what your grandparents call them. They have little coral, little flowers that come up on, up on top. But this is what you're planting, the foliage. A true perennial. Perennial comes back year after year. Remember, perennial and pea both serve with permanent. They both, they come back. Annuals, they started by seed typically, and they're going to be glorious for the year, and then not come back again. It's an annual, one year, perennial, permanent. We grow perennials better than anyone else, really, in the country. You got all the choices. So you'll you'll have fun with this, including peony. I thought I brought a peony. Yeah. So yes, we are selling buckets of dirt here at Water Garden Center. <laughs> uh, but you'll see peonies, you've seen the eyes start to come up. So peonies are one of those crops you don't want to wait to come into the garden center when they're in bloom because they never make it. As soon as they hit a flower, they're gone. Every shopping cart's got one with a flower on it. You want to buy them early for the best choices. The other thing to watch, um, perennials is kind of the dirty secret of, of the ag industry. So most of us like growing annuals because we make more money selling annuals. Put a seed in the ground, six weeks later, sell the crop. You get better crop rotations. Perennials have to be two to three. I've got some five-year-old peonies. Big tree, Ito peonies, they're five years old. They've been at the farm nurtured for five years before we sell them. That's why a perennial is a little more expensive. They have to be at least two years old for them to bloom. So perennials are always more expensive than annuals because they're just taken care of so much longer. And the bigger ones can be, can be even more. But for my friends, you want to plant perennials. Just do it once and done. Don't just pay a little bit more. Pay $3 more and be done. The garden is set rather than replanting every year. Or what I do, I kind of cheat it. I, I anchor my gardens with perennials, but there is something about annuals. I mean, you got uh, here, pansies and snapdragons. These are considered annuals, so they bloom like crazy. These are early spring plants. They love early spring and spring. This will bloom until it gets about 90, 92 degrees, and then they vaporize in the heat. <laughs> you can't water them. It's not worth watering them enough. Just get them out of there, put the petunias or the zinnias or the geranium, some, something else that loves the heat. This nothing shines like this. Through the snow, they're popping up, flowering. Through the snow, these love the cold. Snapdragons, they think they're a perennial. We start them, we, we sell them as annuals, but they actually reseed so prolifically, you're never gonna have just one. You're gonna have more out in the gardens, but they come in a lot of different colors. These are annuals. Perennials, you're planting ones like, like peonies, they live for like 50 years. So they just, they live forever. In fact, the grandparents just divide them, share them amongst neighbors. Here, take, take one of mine. They're heirloom kind of plants. So difference between angels and perennials. Where was I going? Oh, yeah, perennial season. Okay, let's go back. Seasons. Early spring, spring, summer in between. We've got perennial month. Like Before that, I'll have perennials, but you're reading the tag going, can I see the color on that? In June, they're just in color. You can smell, taste. They're just all in bloom. So, so then you got fall or autumn. That's when your maples, all the all the fall color, aspens go in a beautiful gold color. All that we're famous for are fall color. And then in winter, our winter evergreens. If you don't have enough evergreens right now, you feel pretty <laughs> desolate. So 
You need about 20% of your landscape dedicated just to the things that stay green so it looks good. Okay, so it kind of anchors you. So you, you folks from SoCal or from Palm Spring folks, I want it all to be green all the time, but if you just go all evergreen, you miss the lilacs, you miss all the seasons, you miss the, the crepe myrtles, which are deciduous. You kind of want to sprinkle them both of all of them. Okay? So the seasons, frosties, sober water. How are we doing on time? We're doing good. Let me take a sip of my coffee so I can keep going, get revved back up. Okay. Water. I left my business card around. My pictures on the front. It's a good looking photo, I think. <laughs> And I don't want you looking at my picture. I want you looking in the back. It's got the water guide. Okay. So what you'll find is you are watering here 12 months out of the year. This is a hard one to wrap your brain around. Especially for my Midwest folks. You used to turn that system off, point it out, and then never water it again because you've got an eight-foot frost line, which is why you don't live there anymore. It's too cold. Why would you live where there's like permafrost? Down here, the ground freezes a bit. Then it thaws. Like right now, that snowstorm, there is no frost line. There's none. In fact, the snow insulated kept the ground from freezing. If this is like the perfect time to be planting trees, as soon as that ground, as soon as that snow melts, it's going to be so easy. It's going to, the shovel's going to slip in the ground like butter. It's going to spread because it's not rock hard. It's not nice, not icy. And it's not, it's just kind of in this moist climate. Perfect time to add wildflowers. So we've already had that class. But boy, if you're going to add wildflowers, the perfect time is right before the storm hits. The next best time is right after the storm leaves. So, but now is the time that you plant you plants wildflower seed because it's taking advantage of this moisture that we have. Uh, we're watering typically during the growing season, which is April through October, about twice a week. It's good. It's going to be hard for you folks when you're. Your hobby is watering, is watering, not gardening. So every day is not good for plants. They drown, especially your, your bigger rooted things. So big spruce, big aspens, big maples, they want to breathe in between water. So you water real deep and you let it dry out for a few days. I know it's 95 degrees in June. There's a prevailing Southwest wind, it's hot. You, you feel it, you feel your skin start to dry out. Your plants feel it too. But just water it deeply, let it hydrate, let it dry out, and then come back at it again. Now, that's how you do trees, shrubs, vines, roses, the big rooted things. Okay, vegetables, flowers, small rooted things might be different. So there you probably, in June, you probably are watering every day. The tomatoes, they're just big crybabies. If they get dry, they're oh, just so dry. They're just weeping and talking to you all the time. Suck it up, man. It sun's almost down. They perk right back up. Okay, so uh, the other myth with watering, do not water at night. That is a phoenix thing. When you're living 10 miles from the sun and it's 100 degrees out at midnight, who lives down there? It's crazy. Get out of there. It's, it's, we don't get hot like that. We tend, we get very cool. So it's going to dry out. So if you water at night, plants stay wet. If you stay wet, you get mildews, leaf spot, all kinds of bad stuff. And I'll make tons of money off of it. But I don't want that for my friends. I'd rather have you just have easier going. You shouldn't have to deal with leaf spot, powdery mildew, and all this kind of stuff. Water in the morning. Hydrate before the heat of the day. It's going to make for healthier plants. So I'll typically set all my irrigation up. For before eight o'clock in the morning, I'll have cycling at three, four, five o'clock in the morning. So I'm trying to get all the cycles through. I've got eight valves. So everything is on its own little micro irrigation thing and overkill. But I'm an irrigation contractor. It's what we do, okay? You contractors know what I'm talking about. Overdid it. But I'm trying to get all the cycles done before eight, nine o'clock in the morning. They put in the containers. So they're all pumped up, feeling good. Now we're going to heat up and start 10, 11 o'clock, so it's going to be pretty warm. Well, if they're pumped up, they'll get through that much, much easier. It's water in the morning, not at night. Be attempted. But I'm telling you, people are going to say water in the evening. It's going to play out better. Now, I said we're watering 12 months out of the year. So April through October, twice a day, twice a, <laughs> <laughs> twice a week. Uh, in the winter, we're watering twice a month in winter. 
You notice how long we went before we saw moisture since this last storm? We didn't see any water. I mean, I mean, anything to water or irrigate anything, not enough to do any real good for like two months. Plants that are dry and get cold, we get what we call winter burn or winter kill. The tips of the branches die back, so the plant is, is conserving its moisture, keeping the core of the plants alive. If it's dry, it'll sacrifice this. You'll see this play out in spring with red tip virginias, roses, things you'll just see where, oh, why did, why did the top die back? That's called winter kill. The plant got dry with their cold cycle and it burned it off. If you simply turn the irrigation on a couple times a month, pick a nice day, even in January, there's a nice day or two, water that plant, especially new plants. Really critical, okay? So does that make sense? I just covered that whole business card right there. Now, I put it on the back of our business card because the number one thing we get asked, it's made as a resource for you. Take it home and tape it inside your irrigation box. Add it to your garden journal. Put it right there where you can remember because remember, you'll forget. Plus, secretly, I'm trying to get my logo in every, in every irrigation box in Yepai County as best I can. It helps me compete with box. It's working pretty good, but it will be a reminder for you. Okay? Food. You are fertilizing more often. Um, stay away from, for the love of garden, stay away from miracle grow. Throw that junk away. You never have to buy it again. You have permission. It is not gold in a box. It's the most expensive fertilizer ever, and it only works for a couple days where it flushes out the soil. What up here, because we're watering more often, you need a slow release, long, slow release fertilizer. And we're all drinking groundwater. You know that, right? So if there's a big straw in Gino Valley. Actually, there's straws all over the place. We're pumping out of the ground, and we are all drinking it. All of us. There's nothing. There's no lake water. It's all here. You, if you're on a well, you can poison yourself with fertilizer. If you put a bunch of chemical stuff out, petroleum-based stuff, you can actually change your well. We should be using organics. I personally have the ability to poison us all because I'm going to sell four truckloads of fertilizer this year. And I feel like I have a responsibility to just be more responsible for us. And organics are just we're organic gardener. It's just better. So I'll get off my soapbox for a good chill and my blood pressure goes up. Feel strongly about this. This is 744 all-purpose plant food. It's cotton meal, it's bird guano. I put some fairy dust in here. It really does make things grow. But it, it just releases the, ma the magic is every time water irrigation touches it releases a little bit, not all at once. Your Scots, turf builders, all these things, these are, they release all at once. And many times you get a rain event, it, it releases all at once and flushes down, down the river, down the creek, down that dry bed. It just goes down there to fertilize your neighbor's place, not yours. Organics are far better. We also know that you are going to struggle terribly with pH. Your water is very off the charts. So it's the time to touch on that. So. You're going to struggle with high pH, not low. So you're going to read all your fine garden magazines. You're going to tune into your garden channels, listen to that blog. And, hey, take hydrated lime. Lime, it's time, time to put lime out in the yard. Don't ever do that here. You will kill your plants. Lime raises the pH. And for everywhere else in the country, they struggle with acidity. They've got too, their, their soil pH is too low. It's too acidic. They're trying to raise it up all the time. We don't do that. We always do the opposite, try to lower it. So we are, when you hear that, we are adding soil. Sulfur is the opposite of hydrated lime. We add sulfur, not lime. So it's because of your water. Because we're dealing with, well, the reason is well water and every mountaintop you see, Glassford Hill, Thumb Butte, the Williams Mountain, even the San Francisco Peaks, these are all old volcanoes. And all that ash is around the volcano port. Some views of volcano port. All the ash has settled down, and now the water is in between all this ash, which means we have a lot of water. But then we're sticking our straw in there, and it's coming through all this ash. Ash is very high in alkalinity. And so that's why your water is going to come out of the tap higher than normal. So they say 6.5 is the perfect pH. You'll never get there. You can get it down below 8, pretty good. 7.5, it's like magic. So you folks have had pools and hot tubs, you know, you're always, you're always checking the pH. If you get in the, in, the, in the hot tub and it's 
too acid or too alkaline, get out and feel like your skin's going to crawl off. Well, that, that does the same thing for plants in the ground. The pH gets off. So you want to want to watch that. We automatically put sulfur in this because we know you're going to struggle with it. We're going to help you compensate all the time. I tried to get a national brand to do it for us. It's Fertilone working with me. They said, you're too small. I don't want to deal with your part of the country. I'm not doing that. We just put lime in our, our issues. And I'm like, okay, I'll make my own. So we made our own. So it looks a little hokey. That's for a reason. Just white bag with a sticky label. It really works, okay? You're doing this Easter, 4th of July, Halloween. And I really say it, but mine on New Year's, especially if you have a lot of evergreens. So four times a year, you're going to fertilize with this granular food. Okay. So if you're thinking holidays, so so Easter, basically spring, summer, so 4th of July, there's the monsoons hit right then sometimes. You can put some food on right then, your roses will come all into full bloom again. Your crepe myrtles will be over the top. The roses sharons will be well, so many blossoms. The plant will literally fall over. It's that that crazy. Fertilize right there when the monsoons hit. The most important feeding of the entire year, bar none, Halloween. Fall is your most important feeding because it's using all that food to form next spring's growth, next spring's flower. The fruit trees, lilacs, forsythias. Um, if you don't fertilize, what happens is every year, my lilac blooms so great for a couple of years and now it's not blooming. What did I do wrong? What's going on? Uh, they haven't fertilized since they put it in. It just ran out of food. This takes a tremendous amount of energy to form that side, that many roses. That many rows of Sharon's uh, forsythias have that kind of color on a maple tree. It takes a lot of energy to pull that off. And so you're going to need to fertilize more often. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You can do it right now. Absolutely. So she asked, if I miss that, can I do it right now? Yeah. I would do it now. And I would hit it. I don't know. March is kind of a, a sweet spot. It's the start of spring. You really can start fertilizing now through March sometime. And, and Easter's always right right in there. So how much? Uh, it's going to be, so how much? It'll be on the bag. So I can only legally tell you, follow the directions. <laughs> uh, but basically, that bag covers a couple thousand square feet. This is straight sulfur. So I, in the spring, and you'll have this handout here shortly, okay? So it'll be this afternoon, look for it. Tells the four seasons of what to do. In the spring, I use the all-purpose plant food and I put sulfur in my yard because I know I'm gonna struggle so much and even adding sulfur, more sulfur to this. I only do this in the spring and then I, I don't do it again. In the summer, July 4th, July sometime, when you, hear the, when you see the rains coming, I'll hit it with this again. And I'll add uh, humic, which I did not bring up. Humic, H-U-M-I-C. Again, that'll be in the handout. It's humic acid. So plants have struggled to get roots out enough, strong enough. It helps encourage roots. Things that are stressed, they got wind whipped. So sometimes the wind gets so ferocious in the spring, the leaves tear. Um, if you're seeing brown tips on the branches, humic helps it to get a bigger root structure. In the fall of the year, all I do is this. That's it. And in winter, I did mine the New Year's because evergreens have a tendency to get winter chlorosis. They get yellow, they get a yellow hue. You walk around your neighborhood, you'll see some evergreens. It goes, yeah, it looks a lot. It should be greener than that. It's winter chlorosis. This helps keep them spray green. Okay, so that will be the game changer. Um, fruit trees, a couple of insider tips. If you're into edibles, I did make a, so, I can't call this truly, it's all natural. I can't call it organic because you put minerals in there. So sulfur and iron are in that mix. Technically, truthfully, I can't call it organic. It's natural, but this is all organic. For you purists, this is a tomato, vegetable, berry food. You want to keep it 100% organic. This is all the meals, bone meal, blood meal, feather meal, all the mealy things. That's what this is. Okay. So. We got both. We make them both. These are both our recipes. Oh, yeah, you can use this one. I just want to tell folks what the difference is. I got a lot of my earthy, earthy folks, the younger generation loves pure organic. We got that. We're an organic garden. 
I'll help you. We pelletize this. It's easy to spread. Okay. And then for me, just because I'm a rose gardener, just kind of insider, going too deep on, on foods, but thrip and aphids are a real serious problem in early spring. A little tiny bug. Uh, thrip is also called noceum, something they can bite your, your skin sometimes, a little, little welt, kind of you'll feel them. They can be ferocious in April, just as that first flower is coming out of the roses. So for me, it's not organic, but I love roses, so I kind of vary off of my standard. I do put rose food with systemic, which is got a bug killer in it. So you just fertilize around the plant. It will absorb the food and the bug preventer, and it keeps the thrip from getting inside my flowers. Game changer. If you're rosarian, you just love roses. There's nothing. We grow roses really well here. We don't get all the issues with black spot, leaf, all this, all the disease stuff. But we do get thrip in spring. So this seems this seems to give you that first crop. Otherwise, you'll struggle. So it's better to give it on early rather than late. Okay. Cover food, okay? Yeah. I don't see that glazed. What's he talking about? What? It's good. Texas yucca. In the spring, the yeah. bottom is pretty, and for a short time, we get aphids every yeah. year. That helps with that. Yeah, so he's got uh, yuccas, and aphids love the taste of yuccas, so, and they get on this, this big one. That's a big that's a big yucca. Uh, aphids can get on the, up and down the stem, especially with flowers. They love the sweetness. Get on fruit trees, get on roses. Would that help the, the rose food with systemic? Could it be used as yucca food with systemic? Yes, it could. I also have, just while we're on bugs, since we get derailed on that, it is time if you're up where you have pine trees. We have two kinds of pines here, ponderosa pine. We have pinion pines, which are our main ones. Both of them have one bug that, that goes after them. Uh, the ponderosa pine has bark beetle or ips beetle. It's a, it's a cutest little bug. It's about this big, little black thing, but they, they get underneath the bark and they eat the, the cambium layer, the live wood underneath the bark, and they, they, they love parties. So once one comes over, they invite all their friends, and they bring chips and salsa. Here, bring it over here. We're we'll partying right here. And they focus on a, on a tree that's weak, and they take it out. They actually girdle. They, they eat that layer, so it just becomes a girdle. Uh, pinion pines have pinion pine scale. It's a different bug. But uh, you'll see up and down, you'll see a look at your pinion pines. If you look at the, the needle, you'll see a little black dot. It's like someone took a number two pencil, kind of a little dot on there. That is a bug. And they attack the tree, they they pierce that needle, they suck it dry. And so they attack, you'll have each needle has two or three scales on it. If you have that, they both of those bugs can kill the plant. Some of you I know you built your house around some of these natives. And literally the ponderosa comes to the deck, you move the house, have the, the pinion pines, the junipers. If you've got evergreens in your yard and they're they're valuable, and we treat them with tree shrub drench, that's this stuff. You can you do not need to be an arborist. You don't have to pay two grand if someone spray your whole yard. You can do this yourself. You mix this up in a watering can, pour it right around the base of the tree, right where the trunk meets the meets the ground. The plant will actually absorb this up through the cambula, through the live tissue. It will it will taint or, or it's kind of like an antibiotic for for trees. It keeps the bark beetles from eating that, that area and it taints all the, the sap so the, the scale don't, don't suck that plant dry. You're probably going to have to do this every single year if you're in an area that has a lot of natives. So literally bark beetle killed out entire neighborhoods. There's not one tree. The scale will take it out entire streets. So except for the folks that did this, they're healthy and lush. So that's just kind of an insider tip. Watch that. And now's the time to do this. Just as the plants are starting to flow, they're, they're setting heavy buds right now. They're about to break open the next few weeks. You want to you want to treat that whole area. The benefit with this one over others is so you buy at a box store. Your water starting center. We're trying to get better stuff. This one actually travels with the new growth. So as the plant, the old one treats the trunk that's right there, and then as it elongates, it becomes exposed to more scale or bark beetle. This one will actually treat. The core plus it's the new technology basically. Okay, so use the fertilizer train truck trench if you get ever. All right. Yeah. Yes. Does that do anything to other plants in the roots of the tree? 
Uh, will it do other things to other plants? You could treat your roses, keep the thrip out if you want it, although I like the food with the drink, with the systemic, with it. I would not, this is not organic, I would not use this on my, near my vegetable garden, my fruit trees, that kind of stuff. There's better choices for that. But if you have them mixed together, then you should put that around the tree. So if you have them mixed together, you're very concentrated. This goes right where the crown meets the soil. You're very specific. It is right here. It's not going to travel over, over there. It's not going to be, it's going to be concentrated right here. Plants can absorb it up. So I wouldn't be too concerned with it. But, you know, always be careful. You're dealing with bug killers, even organic bug killers. The most dangerous thing I've ever sold, I'm so glad they came to the market. I used to sell nicotine sulfate. It is like death. If it breaks and touches you, you're dead. Everything is dead around it. Completely organic, though. So I just went, and, it, and they sold it in a glass bottle. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, brilliant thinking. There we go. Glad we got rid of that one. It's got that off the shelf as soon as I could. Uh, we should sell a gopher killer with strychnine. They still sell it. You can find it down at the ranch stores. Strychnine is like death. We don't touch it with even gloves on. It's just death. And it keeps killing. It kills the gopher. It kills the coyote that gets, kills the, it keeps on going. So you want to use zinc-based stuff. So we only sell zinc, not, not strychnine stuff. So we've, we've got gopher killers, but we're using the safer. So that's just kind of our, our MO, what we try to do. Okay, here we go. Veggies and fruit. It's time to plant fruit trees. Last week's class was on fruit trees. You missed it. You missed it? Go to YouTube. It's live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So check, check your favorite. Now on our website. Just type in fruit trees, it'll come right up, okay? So uh, fruits, veggies. So you're in early spring planting mode. So things you're planting, leafy things. So broccoli, you're, you're harvesting the flower. Uh, lettuce, spinach, you're harvesting the foliage. Things that you're harvesting the, the, the flower or the, the, the foliage, those are early spring things. So beets, root crops, those are early spring things. Things that you're forming, you're harvesting the fruit, cucumbers, eggplants, tomatoes. These are summer things. Okay, so you got a demarcation line. What's what's the last frost date? Mother's Day. There you go. So you want to plant the things that form a fruit probably closer to that date. And then early spring, you plant, you know, uh, lettuce goes bitter if it gets if it gets too hot, it's just off flavor. Spinach bolts into flowers. It just doesn't taste as good. So it likes the cold. It wants to be cool at night, and the flavor will be sweeter and better. So a lot of mistake I find new folks make, they're getting that last crop of pansies. They've seen them bloom all spring. They're coming in May. I've got you know, 100 of them left. This is the last crop we're going to have. And then for come June, they're going to, you can't keep this alive. It's too hot. And so, but they'll get that last one. They're going, oh, I'm not a very good gardener. You just, you just enjoyed it for, for four weeks, and you need to change up to, to petunias or something. It loves the heat. So it's definite seasons. There's a time for things. When do you start germinating seeds? So seeds, when do you start germinating seeds? I was just writing an article this morning. I got done reading the papers, and I need to go to maturity dates. So you'll see on your tags, maturity dates, or in your seed pack, it says maturity dates. It'll tell you how many days you need to start before it starts to flower or fruit. So it's retreated. So that's an offline conversation. Or tune in. I'll have an article for you in a couple of weeks on maturity dates. Try to get it timely for folks. So, okay. Fruits and veggies. Just know I'll, I'll, I'll send you the uh, veggie calendar. I created a calendar for here. When do you start carrots? When do you start tomatoes? When do you start uh, kale? When do you, it's got all the veggies, it'll be there for you. Just follow that and you'll make far less mistakes and that'll help you. But the temptation, I'm telling you, I will have tomatoes. We're a regional garden center. We got folks from Sedona, Camp Verde, we love you guys, Cornville, you guys rock. Um, they're coming over for their Costco run and their Trader Joe's run. And while they're here, they are, Kingman's coming down to come see the VA and on their way out, catching us on the way out. We're a regional garden center. We are bringing plants in for all elevations, not just for you and Groom Creek. Okay, it's for all of us. So I will have tomatoes starting into March, and they'll be asking for them like now. 
We're trying to hold folks back, but you will be so tempted to put them in the first part of April, end of March. You'll be so tempted, I'm telling you. If you do that, that's fine. Plant them in a container, roll them in the garage every night, and roll them back out during the day. That is actually a thing. It does actually work really well, uh, but don't just leave them out there in the garden or they will get frosty. You'll get some damage. Yeah. Uh, cactus and natives. Doing good. Good group. Well done. Okay. Cactus and natives. So, everyone wants to grow cactus. We can grow choya. It's also called jumping jack cactus or teddy bear cactus. Basically, look at it, get anywhere close to it. It's going to bite you. Um, prickly pears do really well. They do so well, they're boring because they're everywhere. So, they don't want one of those. And then all the other ones don't really grow here. So the things you grow, in, a big mistake I find in Phoenix, they buy them down there because I want it to look like Phoenix, and they come up and they grow fabulous. And then come December, they turn to black mush because they froze, they fall over, and there's no recovery. Another one I find is my California friends. They bring their collection of sedums or succulents over special exotic things. And most of those are succulents. That's a huge family of plants. Most of them are tropical. They don't take cold. They bring them over. They, plant, they do fabulous. Fantastic. They love the heat. Come winter, they turn to black mush and they die. So you can grow. It's, it's number one selling on the country, probably on the planet ever. Your grandparents grew this. It's called hens and chick. So it's a succulent, ground cover, rock garden. This is, will, this is a winter. This loves winter. It turns this beautiful purple color. Winter turns blue and during the growing season, this is lots of drama to it. This is a perennial succulent for here. Just be careful what you're buying because you can see both. Um, so, okay, succulents, cactus. What we do grow fantastically are agaves and yuccas. A couple of yuccas. So, we, these are all native ones. They just love it here. So, we grow more of these than anywhere else. So, uh, let's see, how do I let me start with this one? This is uh, perii agave. It's also called artichoke agave because it looks like an artichoke. Another name for this is century plant. You'll see this growing wild in the countryside. And the myth is every hundred years it blooms with this huge flower. A little bit to get to the rafters. It's 12 feet tall. It's magnificent. Great pollinator. It's fun to watch it grow by the day. Uh, and then once it blooms every hundred years, that mother plant dies. And then the pups underneath it come back and they take over. The way this plant truly is programmed, she's going to bloom like this, seed up here, and then fall over. Boom. And then hopefully 12 feet away, start another family over here. Her family's left back here, and that's how they spread across the hillside. That's how Mother Nature made them. The reason they're so tough is they get this big leathery leaf. And then you'll see how it's programmed. All the pads kind of come to the heart of it. So when it rains, it's a natural rain harvest. It's catching the moisture and it brings it to the heart of the plant and just kind of woos, attracts all the moisture to the to this very fleshy leaf. It makes it very tough. It's very robust. Now, that being said, in your yard with a gardener, about every 10 to 20 years, a little low. So in nature, yeah, every 100 years, it's a total net. But that's the rumor. But in nature, I've had one for a 10-year-old. It was turned into this beautiful, rounded, three by three by three. It went into bloom a couple of years ago. It was beautiful. I still have the flower. Got to just do something with it. I'll paint it red. Put glitter on it. It's beautiful. So tie it up to the fence. Agaves. We've got several here. Now, again, agaves is a big family of plants. You'll be tempted. You shop other places. You'll see that big blue agave. Now, I've tried and tried to get that to grow up here. That's the one they make tequila out. A great big padded agave. It's not going to grow. It's not going to winter over up here. It's not cold hard. It's a zone eight, seven kind of plant. I've tried a couple of times. Don't tell me I can't grow something. You can't grow that one. I've tried. So I don't sell it here. So this one's the number one seller. This is a red yucca or yuccas. It starts blooming in April. It doesn't stop until the fall. It's amazing. Gets up about this tall. Red flowers, hummingbirds. You will have hummingbirds. 
guarantee you're going to love this. Now, the mistake I find a lot of new folks make, they're thinking this is a grass, and it's not. It's an evergreen. Don't let your landscaper come in and cut this down like it's grass. That's a huge blunder I've seen happen way more than once. You're just you're keeping this foliage up, and the flower that's there, you could cut that flower off where it's comfortable, but leave the rest of the structure intact. Okay? Same with agaves. All the yuccas are that way. This is soft leaf yucca, probably the most famous in the country. Uh, it's got a great big white flower to it, very fragrant. It gets pretty big. It's substantial. It gets much larger, three times the size of the red yucca. Sometimes you need something bigger out in the corner of the, up against the fence line. This is the guy for that. Again, that white flower, cut that off as close as you can, and then leave the structure intact. This is soft leaf yucca. We've got a lot of different yuccas. Now we're wrapping it up here. This is a true native. You'll see this growing wild underneath the junipers, the oak trees out in the forest. This is uh, Oregon grape. Holly, or Mahonia is the, is the Latin name. Mahonia, this comes in three sizes, chest high, hip high, and this is the ground cover. So this is as tall as it gets, spreads, kind of just keeps spreading. And then it blooms very, very early. This is kind of, mine are heavily budded, not, not in bloom right yet, but mine are growing on the north side of my house. It's still buried in snow. So as soon as that snow thaws, this will start to bloom. They call it Oregon grape holly because it does form a little grape. Sometimes you'll find at farmers markets and stuff they make Oregon grape jams and stuff. Quite honestly, you'll never get any because the birds think they've died and gone to heaven. They just love the taste of the berries on this thing. So it's a it's a good good attractor. I use this personally underneath my junipers. I've got this magnificent male juniper, huge. It's got to be two two and a half stories high and wide hundreds of years old. I've pruned it up because the trunk on it is like ginormous. I've got two of them. It's a character piece. My entire backyard is defined by this juniper. Junipers, they, are, they naturally try to kill off everything underneath them. So they literally, they, they literally throw stuff off to bury things so they don't have to, all this water and nutrients are for me. It's a defensive thing. So they tend to kill everything underneath it. There's only two things I've found that grow underneath my juniper. This does really well. And this is a weed. This is called periwinkle or vinca. Or it's got a lot of names throughout the country. Vinca is the, is the common kind of Latin name to it. It is an evergreen perennial, brown cover. Um, if you stand still too long, this will actually try to grow up, pull up your leg, you know, takes over the beds. Don't introduce this in the middle of your flower bed or you'll have nothing but this for two or three years. So you put this on the outer edge, outer edge over here where it just, irrigation barely reaches it. That's where you put it, where the, where the driveway comes down, all that oil and gunk floats off over this way. Put it right there to suck up all the, the dirt and grime stuff. When it gets out of control, run it over the truck. That's kind of, that's how you keep this one in traffic check. Harry, this is a weed. But it's a good weed. I use it a lot in my containers at the front edge because it gets long tendrils and kind of flows down. It's evergreen. And it blooms to these quarter size bipedal flowers really well. These two have grown really the juniors. Lastly, we'll wrap it up with this. This one is evergreen. This is its winter look. Interesting thing about this quite a, quite a few plants. A lot of your evergreens are not evergreen. But they're see they have foliage. This one's actually bright green during the growing season, but has this burgundy color. And if it's exposed to more sun, it turns more burgundy. Uh, Nandina, or, or you folks in California, heavenly bamboo is the name. Uh, we have several different varieties, but in the full sun, they turn bright red. Really pretty. In the more shaded areas, they'll stay green. So they have this cycle, this, this character to them. Yeah. Deer Adelaide don't like it. They're, they're, it's, it's a good plan for them. That's once talk to a sidebar. We go, eh, probably going to stay away from that one. But buy another one of these. That's probably you're better off. With that. We can help you with that. Um, I mentioned a couple things here. So time to plant. We're down to the last one. To do's now. Fertilize now. 
Treat your evergreens with the tree instructor now. Uh, you can plant pansies, kale, ornamental kale now. When it's cold, wait. Plant these when they're cold, not when it's hot. Don't wait till spring. Don't wait till Mother's Day to plant these. Plant them before. Uh, vegetables, especially leafy vegetables, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, lettuce, spinach, all your leafy. Those are planting now. Okay, early. Don't wait till Mother's Day, or they will bolt, get all flavored. You want to plant those early. Okay. That uh, is time. Plant roses now. So we have two cycles of roses. The newest, these just came in. These are called fiber pots. It's just grown inside a, 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 a basically a peat moss pot. You plant a pot and all, grows right in it. But you're going to be tempted to plant bare root roses here. Don't subject yourself to that kind of torture. Okay? They don't, you're going to have a 50% loss rate, and that's if you've got really green thumbs. Bare root. But a bare root rose is we've grown it to the farm. And then we just rip it out of the ground, no soil, put it in a bag with some sawdust. So here you want this. But in a dry climate without the roots, the fail rate is very high. So we took the bare root last year, we potted them up in this peat moss, this, this peat pot. So now you've got a bare root rose that's fully rooted, so it's not bare root anymore. So now your success rate goes to virtually 100%. Uh, for, and you'll find the newest varieties, the more exotic. The latest ones you're reading about, if you're into roses, those are the newest, greatest, funnest. I want it to glow in the dark. I want, butter, I want it covered with butterflies all the time. Never have aphids. Never, you want that. That's when you find them now. This is the first crop. I have a thousand roses that land the last week of April. They're all going to be big, not, not fiber pots. They're going to be five gallon, fully matured, big roses, all in full bloom. It's kind of a hoop. The garden world will talk about it. The entire front parking lot will be nothing but roses. I have to wait till the frost. I don't want to bring them in. That's a lot of money. And then have frost come and take all the flowers. It won't hurt the plant. It just they won't bloom. And I got to reset for three or four weeks before they bloom again. So we time it so we're just out of frost. Remember, our last frost date was the first week in May. So we'll bring it in. We'll cheat it, getting ready for Mother's Day. Because, you know, guys don't know what to get their gals. Roses. It's good ones. We strategy. It's retail. So, and it's just roses do really, really well. And so that's when you'll see. I won't have the latest grade of all the name varieties. Uh, but this one's catch with mustard. I will have this one in spring, but I can't keep it in stock. It's a new variety. It's got red petals on the front, and the back of the petal is yellow. So it's got catch it with mustard on the same flower. It's striking. I can't keep it in stock. So it'd be, you'd be almost better off plant this because you know you got one. Uh, so because when the new ones show up, it's yeah, just kind of the cycles we're dealing with. Does that do great in the container? It would do great in the container. Yeah. The roses do fantastic in the container. Yeah. So what's that? Does that, have an odor? Does that one have an odor? Fragrance. <laughs> yes. Uh, Yes, it does have a fragrance. There are some better Chrysler Imperial, I mean, there's Fragrant Cloud, there's some other ones. That's for April. If you like fragrance, don't read the tag, just smell the fluff because they're all in bloom. Okay, the other one you need to be worried about right now, just on track before we end, you should be fertilizing. You should finish up your pruning. You need to get done cutting back the, the grasses, getting your, your fruit trees opened up, getting back your Cutting back your roses, you should be finishing up your pruning. When you get done with all that, spray the entire yard with horticultural oil. This is, there are bugs in your yard. There are eggs in your yard. So this is an organic solution. It's the safest thing you can get. You put, it, put the hose right here, turn it on, and just hose things down. It's going to kill any eggs that are left over from last year. Any bugs are now in, in the nooks and crannies of the, of the bark. They're down at the base, they're hanging out, waiting for the warmth to come. This just kind of cleans the yard up. So you start with, they start clean. They can always fly in at you, but at least you start clean. Critical for, for fruit trees, roses, things you've had, your uh, uh, yuccas, things you've had problems with, just spray it with horticultural oil. It's just too easy. I like to prune first, then spray, so I don't have to use as much spray. There's less material. 
to spread them. Okay. Um, I think, oh, one last thing. Weeds. We've already seen dandelions are already this big. <laughs> they're a cool, they're an early spring thing. Uh, foxtail, cutest little grass. It's going to come the second, the second the ground sees any kind of sunlight, you're going to see beautiful spring grass. And then it turns into this gnarly bird that the bird wants to go through your sock, out your ankle, out the other side. Dogs <laughs> limp around. It's, it's a bad weed, but it looks innocent. These are all annual weeds. They come back by seed, only by seed. So uh, uh, goat hip, that's one that has a, it's got a seed pod with a thorn on it. You walk on it, it's like, God, your dogs are kind of going, oh, help me, mom, help me. That's an annual. It only comes back by seed. If you know that, most of our weeds are seed. This is weed and grass preventers, maybe going a little deeper than on weeds and stuff, but because we have so much grass, we don't have grass, we have rock lawns. You'll find weeds. If you see one weed in a rock lawn, it bugs you. You just can't see that. Mm -hmm. And so we did, this, is, this is a weed and grass stopper. You spread it like fertilizer, and it keeps the seed from germinating, but a taproot down. It doesn't let the taproot start. And a bag covers about 5,000 square feet. So it's preventative. It does not affect weeds already up. It doesn't affect Rosemary already up. Doesn't affect roses already up. It only affects seed. So you got to put it down before you have a problem. So spread it now to prevent dandelions, uh, goat head, foxtail, all these early early winter stuff. Do it now. Actually, I do this twice a year in my own yard. We've got two main growth cycles now. All the early spring stuff. And when the rains come, that's when tumbleweeds turn the size of like. BW beetles, when whorehound gets taught, just terrible weed where the root goes to China, that's when they start taking over. Spread it right before the rains come, and it will eliminate 90, 95% of all of your weed. Okay, you won't have to use Roundup, which is actually cancer in bottle. You just don't want to use Roundup. Uh, this will eliminate a lot of it. Okay, yes. What about elm tree seeds? Elm tree seeds, you is should not. You should get rid of elms. That's a weed. Chinese elm or Siberian elm has several names. It's a big, big tree, uh, but it's 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 also called a widow maker. It's last storm. Lots of broken branches are on it. But it, I would say if you have a lot of elms, get a brand new chainsaw, start using it. But then start planting some other things that aren't as weedy. So there's there's ten bugs in the area that if you get on a plant that elms will get twelve. It's got slime flux, it's got all these, and then it throws seed all over the yard. So it comes up everywhere. So it's a problem. So you just don't want that. There's better elms. If you're going to do elms, come talk to us. We've hyped, we've bred the, the seed out of it, and it doesn't get the elm leaf skeleton. There's a, bug, there's a bug that scrapes off all the foliage, makes it look terrible. So we can help you with that. That's, again, that's, we can do sidebar stuff, so help you all the time. And this is the greatest device ever. Look. They even fold out now. They become even bigger. They're like mini iPads. And so you can bring this in. Take a picture. Don't, don't try to describe it. Your words aren't good enough. There's too many red flowers that go this big that butterflies love. Take a picture. Bring it in. We get an idea like that. Perfect. These are the greatest little devices ever. I probably look at 10, 20 of them a day. Different ones. Yeah. Fabric is great. So I, I mentioned fabric earlier. So we typically do landscape, put our fabric down, put a rock on top of that. Fabric is great in that it allows food and nutrients, water to go through it, but it doesn't allow seed to come up. The negative with fabric is um, we think it's going to solve all of our weed problems. The problem is we get so much wind and, and dust and stuff that gathers up between the fabric and the rock that we still get some, some weeds. Still show up, not as many. So show up if you put the weed and grass stopper. I got that powered up with my hand spreader. I'm gonna throw it over the rock lawn, around the flower, or in the flower beds, around the trees. I, there's two things I despise about gardening. I just hate everything about it. I don't ever want to water. That's why we invented computers to run irrigation. And I don't like weeding. This we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden because of that, giving us weeds. That's a curse. I don't like either one of those. So anything I can do to eliminate those two chores, it takes the work out. 
the, the enjoyment comes up. Yeah. You do it on all around composting. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm a big composter. Composting's awesome. It's like it's like black gold, really. Uh, go to our website, watersgardencenter.com. You probably got my card. Type in compost. I've got a handout just on just on how to compost. And what you'll find here is you tend to have a compost that's not green enough. You don't have enough stuff to ignite it, and it's not wet enough. You'll probably have to, to water your irrigation pile some because it dries out so quickly it shuts down. So those are two bits, just personal things i found. I think it'll probably help you with yours. But compost is awesome. We did grass stopper, but not kill everything, just seed. Don't put wildflowers down and then put this down. It will not let the wildflowers. In effect, seed. It's just seed, not plants. It'll, it'll take out, I notice a little, a few of the real, very young weeds. Take them off, but if they get up to this size, it's not going to affect them. So just affect the seed. You want to put it on now, I'm telling you, this is the right now exclamation before the weeds because they're about to come up. I'm telling you, we are one step away from full on spring. We're two weeks out before forsythia. I think daffodils are going. We already, we can't hold them back here. We don't keep this house. But they're still sort of bloom because uh, they just want, they want spring. But it is, the days are getting longer. And they're seeing the daylight's longer, but it's got to be time. Let's go. So, okay, I will hang out as long as you want. See the plants? Anyone got the sign up board kind of thing? Is that around someplace? Oh, where did it go to? Who's got it back there? Let's find it so we can get it around. There you go. You find it? Oh, back there. There you go. Just take your time. We're all gardeners, we like each other. We love fancy floral gloves and big hats. It kind of describes gardeners. Okay, take your time. I will hang out as long as you want. Answer as many questions. I'm here until you're done. If you didn't ask your question, you got something else? But before I let you go, I'll let you clap. There you go. <laughs>